the preferred me method of interpersonal communication between young people now is texting. That's an, also a major technological revolution because what it's done, I would say, for the first time, is reduce the cost of rejection to males to zero because it hides it. The only people you ever hear from are people who haven't rejected you. It's really at arm's length and you can right. swipe very rapidly and so you can get all that <laughs> rejection over with in a very short period of time. Right. And the, uh, Tinder also reduces... One of the other things that you want to think about with regards to sex, and I think this is probably particularly true for women, is that to what degree is it in women's interests to allow the cost of sex to fall to zero? Because with pornography certainly does that. And it just seems to me that's not a very good long-term strategy for relationships between men and women because whatever sex is worth the cost of zero is the wrong price i've heard from a number of women what written read blog reports on their frustration with their attempts to be relatively sexually selective let's say they decide that they're not going to sleep with their new partner on the first date they're frustrated by the fact that to the degree that they're being cautious in their sexual behavior which I think is actually an admirable idea, that they're instantly outcompeted, especially if their partners are somewhat impulsive, by women who will say yes at the drop of a hat. And again, I don't think... It depends on what the goal is. That's the thing, is that there's short-term sexual gratification, but the literature indicates that married couples, for example, or couples in a permanent, long-term monogamous relationship are more sexually satisfied than single people. And maybe the single people have to be parsed out into those who are sexually successful and those who aren't. But I suspect that wouldn't make that much difference. But whatever. There's the utility of relatively immediate sexual gratification, for whatever that's worth, and the adventurousness that goes along with that, let's say. The hunt and the excitement of having a new partner and all of that. And maybe even the danger that's associated with that, because people like to have a little bit of danger in their life. But What's the goal? It's what do people want? There's a great book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by Google engineers. And so it contains great psychology because Google engineers don't care about political correctness and they just write down what they find. and They don't even notice that it's politically incorrect. Hence James Damore, for example. And what they found was that women use pornography just as much as men, but the pornography that women use is verbal. It's not imagistic. And the, the pornographic novels, essentially, follow the same extraordinarily standard plot line to the degree that publishing houses like Harlequin, in the Harlequin series you have the ones that were published like in the 1970s that are pretty, they're tame, but the plots are quite similar and the plot is young, relatively innocent woman finds powerful, interesting, dangerous male tames him, and it's the Beauty and the Beast plot. Men are much more visually oriented sexually. With sexual behavior, the question is, what's the end game? And that this is what people have to ask themselves, is like one of the corollaries to the female pornographic romance is actually the establishment of a long-term relationship. And the question is, it's so funny because I got pilloried in the New York Times for talking about enforced monogamy. It was an anthropological term and all it means is that there's a pronounced proclivity in human societies around the world to enforce monogamous relationships at multiple levels of the sociological hierarchy. You do it culturally. And enforced monogamy, so it, my son was just married, and if he came to me next year and he said, hey dad, guess what, I've managed to have four affairs in the last year with hot women and my wife hasn't found out about any of them, I'm gonna say, what the hell's up with you? You violated the vow that you took, you're putting your whole future at risk, you're betraying yourself and your wife, and that's enforced monogamy. The idea is that the social norm is the establishment of a long-term monogamous relationship and that there are strictures put in place to support that but also to punish deviation from it and you say maybe not so much on the punishment end but you can't it depends it's, what do you want what, what is it that you want you want a long-term stable relationship or not and if that's the goal then your behavior should be devoted to whatever it is that facilitates that goal and I don't see that I certainly don't see that casual and impulsive sex fits that bill not in the least and all of the evidence with regards to living together shows that's actually detrimental to the establishment of a long-term relationship. So, first of all, common law marriage, people who are in common law marriage are much more likely to be divorced. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, people who live together before they get married are much more likely to be divorced after they get married. So the idea that you can try someone on for size and see how it works, and then you're gonna see if you're compatible, it's like, 
That's one story. Another story is, how about you and I live together for a little while, and if you're not so bad, but maybe I can find someone better, and if I do in the next year and a half or so, because we're not hooked together in any formal way, I can just trade you in. It's okay, you can do the same to me. But I don't really see that as the sort of complementary mutual interaction that leads to the formulation of long-term trust. And I think it's a better story for interpreting what constitutes living together than we're going to try each other out because that's what mature people would do. But what most importantly, the data indicate that it doesn't work, is that you're more likely to get divorced, not less likely. Because maybe the right attitude is, you're probably about as flawed as me, and we're lucky that we found each other, and so let's see if we can make a commitment, because we're engaging in something that's very risky, an intimate relationship, and we're going to commit to each other and see if we can build something of value across time. And there's a definite a risk in that, but there's a compliment to your partner.